Thank you very much. Let me, uh, I'm just going to share a thought I had just a few minutes ago, uh, and that was uh, how th this project with the four co-authors was a lot of fun, but also how it was enabled by technology. Um, if we take this technology for granted, for instance, we work very collaboratively. We never met. Sita and John had never met until yesterday. Uh, so we use Dropbox, we use con free conference calls, we use open source MATLAB and so forth. But I was just thinking, if we tried to do this 50 years ago, and we were sending drafts through the post office or whatever, uh, and we're trying to write code from scratch with, uh, without these uh, easier to use, it would have been extremely hard. Uh, and this wasn't, I don't think, extremely hard. It, it, technology enabled this, this product project so uh, here's an example where uh, technology was complementary to an older guy's labor. Uh, uh, so there you go. So what are we thinking about? We're thinking about um, you've got somebody uh, who's kind of got a life cycle plan, a kind of retirement uh, plan, uh, and they're in the mid-career, uh, but they've had a life cycle plan for a while, and uh, they now are kind of mid-career, 45, 55, something like that. We look at both those ages, and they think, maybe I need to take my assumptions down, uh, both for the wage growth that I'm going to have in the future and for the safe rate of return that I might be able to earn. And we want to look at what does that mean uh, for uh, various aspects. So here's, uh, I tried to write down, or we tried to write down, what is the uh, research question? So what are the consequences of reducing future projections of real uh, interest rates and or real future wage rates uh, for mid-career uh, workers? And so what do they do if they have to take their assumptions down from what they previously were? And things we're going to look at are, what do they do about their consumption, or for that matter, their saving? It's kind of their flip side of each other. Uh, what do they do about their age that they claim Social Security uh, at? Uh, uh, what, uh, if they do reduce these assumptions, you could think of that's equivalent to a wealth hit uh, and um, kind of a compensating variation. Uh, how much wealth would offset the harmful effects of these lower assumptions? Uh, and then uh, what does it do on their incentives to work longer than they previously had uh, projected? You might wonder what Seed is doing standing here. She's going to cover at least half the slides, and so uh, we're going to kind of try to both uh, say something. I'm going to talk about the first five slides, and then she's going to take over, and I'll come back at the end. So reasons you might want to take down your assumptions. Well, first of all, real interest rates have been very low for quite a while now, a decade. Mo lower than you would have uh, set, guessed 20 years ago, roughly, or 20, 25 years ago when you set up your plan. And so you might think, well, maybe they're going to stay low. Then there is a macroeconomics literature called the R-star literature, the natural rate of interest. And all that is is basically saying we know that at low interest rates, you're trying to stimulate the economy. Uh, inflation will tend to uh, move up if you have these low interest rates, uh, and the, G the uh, GDP will tend to grow faster than potential. It's kind of an expansionary low interest rates. And we know if you have high interest rates, you're trying to slow the economy. GDP will, growth will slow. Inflation may decelerate. Well, there must be an interest rate in between, which is neutral, uh, which is neither expansionary nor contractionary. That's what the macro guys call R star. That's what the Fed thinks about all the time. Are we at roughly the neutral rate of interest, or are we currently expansionary or contractionary and so forth? We're looking for, in the long run, you would think this natural rate of interest would be what you would predict for the next 20 years on average. So we're going to look at that literature. And finally, uh, real wages have grown very slowly. Uh, and um, you might uh, have assumed things were going to be better than you now are assuming. So you're changing your assumptions mid career so this is a uh, graph um, of the uh, one person's graph, or two people, uh, Laubach and Williams, uh, big players in this R-star literature. 
and this is what they think the time trend uh, has been for the natural rate of interest, the uh, sort of uh, not expansionary, not contractionary rate of interest. And you can see uh, that uh, in the 1990s, it was around 3%. It kind of fluctuated a bit, but uh, it was kind of around 3%. It gradually fell to 2%, and then 2008, it went to zero. Uh, and it has stayed at zero. Some fluctuations, but it hasn't gone anywhere. Actually, in our work, we're going to be conservative, and we're going to say, uh, that uh, the person, when they initially had a plan, he chose 3%, they're taking it down to 1. We could have actually probably justified 0, but we, we, we took it down to 1. By the way, I looked today at what the TIPS rates are, and they're basically 1% at all maturities. Um, so it, 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 anyway, you've taken down your assumptions because of that. The other thing in the same, oh, I was going to say this Laubach and Williams, well, who is this character, Williams? Well, he's now the president of the New York Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, this is John Williams. I was the president of San Francisco Federal Reserve. So it's not like some random researcher. This is a guy who actually might be able to influence whether uh, uh, current interest rates are expansionary or contractionary. How close are we uh, to the natural rate? In the same analysis, you get a... Uh, um, figure for how fast can potential output grow. Um, uh, and uh, just like our star, potential output is not observable. Real output is, you know, actual output is observable. But, but you get this estimate of where, where potential output is. And it was growing at about 3.4%. The most recent estimate is 2.4%. That might have some, something to do with why you would take wages uh, down. The economy is just not growing as fast. Some of it may be labor supply and so forth. But I think we know that certainly blue collar or uh, mid, um, uh, that, well, let's say blue collar, blue collar wages have been stagnant in real terms for a long time. And, uh, and uh, you might be recognizing that in mid-career where you were a little more optimistic before. I think this is where we hand it off. Isn't that right, Zita? So I'm going to show you. Um over here, this, this is some um, uh, age earnings profile that we constructed. It's one of the inputs into the model that, that I'm going to present to you. We use current population survey data um, to uh, construct um, a relative age wage uh, profile. Um, so this is the ratio of the average full-time wage at each age relative to the average full-time age in wage in, in the economy. And we, we construct full-time wages by taking um, hourly wage, um, a measure of hourly wage in the, in the, from the CPS and multiplying by, by I think it was 2,000 hours uh, per year. Um, and so one, another thing to kind of point out here is there's not much growth as a result of age beyond age 40 or so. So in so, so really, wage growth beyond age 40 or so comes from economy-wide um, average wage growth. Um, in our model, we, we take this profile and we grow it by the entire, um, by, by the economy wage um, average growth rate. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about our model. Um, we consider a standard life cycle model that, that includes social security and a borrowing constraint. Um, the, we have a representative worker in this model who starts work at age 20, potentially lives to age 110, um, and is able to invest in actuarially fair annuities. Um, all assets earn a safe return. Um, and uh, the individual um, chooses when to claim Social Security. Um, retirement in the model is exogenous, but later we're going to consider varying this exogenous retirement age and looking at the impact on, on welfare. Um, we impose the Social Security earnings test as follows. If you're below the full retirement age, which is 67 for everybody we consider, um, you can't claim before you retire. Um, we consider single men who were born in either 1965 or 1975, um, and we imagine that they establish a plan at age 20, which is when they enter the labor force. Um, and in establishing this plan, they correctly anticipate uh, the future path of, of uh, wages, of inflation, and of interest rates all the way through 2018. Okay, so, so now it's 2018. Um, and um, 
they're reconsidering. So, so the 1965 birth cohort is, is, uh, is aged uh, 54, and the 1975 birth cohort is aged 44. Um, so under the baseline, um, they're going to assume that, that uh, the economy and that real interest rates continue roughly in line with, with historical averages. So they're going to assume a 3% real interest rate and a 1% uh, real wage growth rate. Um, however, they're also considering taking down these assumptions because, because of uh, uh, all the stuff that John mentioned about uh, low R star and, um, uh, and stagnant real wage growth. Um, so, so we consider scenarios in which they reduce their interest rate assumption to 1% and either their own wage growth or average economy-wide wage growth um, down to 0% um, real. Okay, so here's the baseline solution to the model. Okay, and in, in the baseline, we've assumed that the real interest rate is 3% and that real wage growth is 1%. So this is for the 1965 birth cohort, and the, the solution looks pretty standard. Um, you've got constant consumption at age 54 onwards. The liquidity constraint is not binding here. Um, we've also assumed that the real discount rate equals the real interest rate, so that accounts for the flat profile of, um, of consumption. Assets peak right at retirement, which is assumed to be exogenous at age 65 in, in this diagram, and then you start drawing down on assets. The optimal social security claiming age is, is 68. So if you, if you look at the line representing income, you've got your income from work going all the way um, till you retire at age 65, then income drops down to zero, you're drawing down on your assets until age 68, then you start receiving social security income and you draw down slower on your assets. Um, so this is the situation where claiming is, is independent of retirement, it occurs after, after retirement. Um, so this is the same diagram for the 1975 cohort, for the younger cohort, um, you basically have the same pattern. There's not, not any huge differences. Um, so alternative scenarios that we look at, and there are a number of them in the paper, um, we're only, we're only going to present uh, about four of them here in this presentation. So scenario one, we take down the real interest rate assumption um, from 3% to 1%. Um, okay, and then scenario three from the paper, um, we take down the, the aggregate real wage growth assumption, um, as well as individual real wage growth assumption. We, we, we assume that individual wages grow in line with, with aggregate wages um, from, from a real rate of 1% to 0%. Um, so basically, we're reducing nominal wage growth to 2.5% to, to equal the assumed inflation rate. So that's scenario three. Um, in scenario four, we do both changes. We take down the real interest rate. We also take down the um, real wage growth rate to zero. Um, and then scenario six, let's assume that economy-wide average wages continue to grow at uh, close to historical averages, um, but your individual real wage growth Falls. Okay, so we're going to contrast that with, with uh, scenario three, where economy-wide wage growth is following, falling along with your individual um, wage growth. Um, so just a word about uh, future consumption and um, real interest rates. Um, changing the real interest rate in the model changes the relative price of future consumption. Um, if P of T and R is, is the price today for $1 of future consumption at time T given real interest rate R, um, the formula for that relative price is 1 over 1 plus the interest rate raised to the T. So if we're taking down interest rates from 3% to 1%, that's going to change the relative price of future consumption. In particular, when we reduce from 3% uh, to 1%, um, the, the price of a dollar of consumption at time t increases by a factor of 1.03 divided by 1.01 raised to the t. This graph kind of gives you an idea of the magnitude of that. So, so you've got years in the future and the relative price change. Um, is, so, so, so taking down the interest rate has a greater impact on the relative price of future consumption as we move further out in the future. So that's going to be significant when we look at the results. Um, so, so this is figure 5A from the paper. Basically, what we've shown here is the change from the baseline paths of consumption, income, and assets. And this is for scenario one, where we've taken the real interest rate assumption down to 1%. A couple of things to notice. Consumption now declines continuously 
um, and that's because of that change in the, in the relative price of consumption, initial consumption and, and saving are essentially unchanged. This optimal social security claiming age increases from 68 to 70 because now the gains from delay have increased as a result of lowering the, the real interest rate, um, and assets are reduced relative to the baseline. Okay, so what about, um, and this, this is for the 1975 birth cohort, so we've got, um, Similar results there. Um, here's, here's the change um, from, from the baseline paths of consumption, income, and assets from scenario three. This is, again, for the 1965 birth cohort. A um, couple of things to note here. The impacts are much smaller. This is scenario three. We're just reducing wage growth. Um, consumption remains flat because we have not altered the, price of the, the relative price of future consumption. Saving initially increases slightly, but then it falls below baseline. Um, retirement income is lower um, due to lower social security. Um, so so that's, that's for the 1965 birth cohort. Um, here's here's uh, scenario four. So this is where we take both assumptions down, and this is for the 1975 birth cohort we've shown. Um, and uh, what we see here is we've taken down the interest rate assumption, so consumption does fall continuously. Um, an interesting thing we find, saving is actually reduced between ages 55 and 65 for this cohort. In other words, income falls more than consumption does. Um, and you also see a, an optim a change in the optimal Social Security claiming age. It goes up to 70 again, and this is because we've taken down the uh, interest rate assumption. Uh, so I think I'll turn it back over to John here. Uh, of results, uh, just quickly, this is um, for scenario one, this is the wealth equivalent. If you didn't have to change your assumptions, uh, or, uh, sorry, with the change of assumptions, how much wealth would you need to get back to the kind of lifetime utility you had before? And these are pretty big numbers. Notice that uh, that, uh, I'm sorry, scenario one, it's two times your uh, income, uh, your con annual consumption, and uh, scenario four, it's three, this, that's the both scenario, it's three times your annual consumption. And this is for the 1965 uh, birth cohort. If we look for the younger people where the wage cut hurts more, then this uh, both low interest rates and low wage growth it's five times your annual consumption is the wealth hit. So it's uh, pretty uh, uh, significant. Uh, the other thing on this chart to notice is that scenario six versus scenario three, your own wage growth is exactly the same in both those scenarios. You've taken down your wage growth in both cases, but in scenario three, everybody's wage growth is down. In scenario six, only yours is down, and you're better off if you're alone than if uh, the economy-wide uh, wages have gone down by about 20,000 bucks, just comparing the numbers in column in what we call scenario six with scenario three. So that was, in some sense, a new result for us. I don't think we necessarily anticipated it, um, but we now understand it. Uh, and Social Security actually treats you better if your wage has gone down, but other wages have not gone down the way the indexing works, uh, because you're going to be considered relatively poorer, and the progressivity of the system is going to work in your favor. It's almost as if you're insured from individual wage cuts, but not from economy-wide wage cuts. Uh, this uh, next one uh, is the uh, uh, wealth equivalent of working an oh, additional year. This is the, so in the base case, working an additional year is worth, but you see the numbers, but basically uh, $45,000 or so, but with the low interest rates, working an extra year would be worth more, uh, 55, an extra 10,000 bucks or so. Uh, when they're both in place, both the low wages and the low interest rates, again, working longer is worth more than in the base case. But if just wages went down, of course, it's worth less uh, to work more. So the, the work incentives uh, change, but if you've gone to a complete low growth environment with the interest and the wages down, actually working longer is worth more than it was uh, before. And that's kind of what this uh, banner uh, says, uh, that lower interest rates make working longer better, uh, lower wage growth uh, make it worth less. 
uh, what do we have here? Um, uh, oh, this is claiming on retirement. I'm not going to, this is if you claim Social Security on retirement, pretty much the same stories are in that graph. I'm not going to point that graph out. This is kind of important. Uh, this is comparing uh, scenarios uh, six and uh, scenario three. Look at these bottom numbers. So this is for the younger cohort, the 1975 birth cohort. Uh, if you take your wage growth down to 0% real for the rest of your career, you still get, by the way, you get the age earnings profile stuff, but the, you're assuming that you're not going to get any benefit from the rising wages uh, in the economy. If it's you alone, you lose 4.6% on your Social Security. But if you're taking everybody's down, it's 15%. It's a major amount of insurance in some sense that Social Security is providing if it's your idiosyncratic wages. If you're pessimistic about yourself, yeah, Social Security will in some sense share the losses. If you're pessimistic about everybody, it doesn't share the losses. So uh, that's uh, interesting to me. Uh, the other thing that we were just pointing out, uh, and you can see it uh, in uh, this row right above the banner, that consumption doesn't necessarily go down when you take the interest rates down. CETA said it's about unchanged. Actually, it's slightly up. Consumption goes up. Savings goes down in a scenario when the rate of return is taken down. That seems very different than what financial advisors tell you. Financial advisors tell you if rates of return are down, you've got to make it up by saving more. We say, well, that's actually not optimal. Uh, you're, um, if interest rates are lower, you're poorer. Also, the relative price of the future just went up, as Sita said. And actually, the optimal thing to do is save a little bit less, not more. So we're pretty much done. Here's our results. Uh, lower interest rates and or lower wage growth. They're major wealth hits for mid-career workers. That's that compensating variation stuff. Uh, changes in optimal saving, we're not going to make a big deal about it, other than that they're small. They might be one way, you might save a little more, you might save a little less. You don't, there's no major change in your saving required uh, in the optimal solution. Uh, lower interest rates tend to encourage later claiming of Social Security. I shouldn't say tend. They do encourage later uh, claiming of Social Security. Uh, lower interest rates uh, increase the returns to working longer. So, and uh, finally, well, not finally, uh, Social Security partially insures against reductions in individual wages, but not against reductions in economy-wide wages. And so that's that insurance feature that comes through the progressivity of Social Security. And lastly, uh, if you think you hear, uh, if you're going to face low returns, you should save more, uh, that's not supported uh, by this work. And I think that's all we got, right, Gina? I think that's all. Yep. OK. John Sablehouse is our discussant. So usually I go through my disclaimer very quickly. I just sort of wave my hand. But John has me talking about interest rates in the macro economy today. So, so I'm going to read it very carefully. He's, Cameraman, can you zoom in and make sure that the Fed sees? I have read this. No, I'm kidding. All right. This is a great paper. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. I'm just going to repeat probably John's last slide. So our starred wage, uh, real wage growth are lower now uh, than they were historically. If we look at these two cohorts who spent much of their working years in the higher growth, higher interest rate environment, they're suffering large mid-career wealth shocks. This lower R star is going to increase the benefits of longer work. The lower G reduces the benefits of longer work, but not as much as, uh, as the R star effect. Uh, the, the lower economy-wide wage growth, AWI, is worse than the idiosyncratic low growth which they call WWI for worker wage index, I guess is that what that means. And most importantly, uh, your financial advisor is giving you bad advice. Uh, save less, not more. So I thought about how to organize my comments for this paper. It goes, covers a lot of ground. So I went to the JEL and thought about this. I said, well, one thing I could do is touch on each of these. Or I could just be pretty selective and think about mostly big picture things. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, so the first point I want to make is that some of the takeaways from the model and the simulations are very transparent, but some are not. And uh, I think working through that mechanism will help. 
Um, the second point is that the optimal responses likely vary by lifetime income. So we're working with a, a model that has one representative agent per cohort, and I think this is easy to do. I'm not the one who has to program it, but I actually think it's pretty easy, given the model structure and given all the care that went into coding up the Social Security rules, I think you can run different types of agents through this model and see how uh, the answers vary. But then I'm going to spend uh, the last part of my time thinking a little bit about R star and G in a bigger, sort of more macro sense. And, and does it matter for the conclusions here why R star and G are lower? And then what does accepting this, the, the fact, or acknowledging the fact that R star is lower and G is lower, what does that imply about optimal social security design? So this is a uh, standard life cycle model calibrated to uh, these 1960s and 70s cohort earners. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, really, really great background work that goes into this, uh, coding up the, uh, the Social Security. Uh, the average potential earnings profile is done very carefully, not just looking at total earnings, but separating out potential earnings. So um, by, by looking at wage rates with the CPS and outgoing rotation group, uh, lots of great work there. And uh, there's optimizing decisions about claim age. Uh, one thing I don't know, uh, uh, there's, I don't think it's in the paper, I couldn't find it, is uh, the nature of utility. I think it's CRA utility uh, with a constant discount rate. And they actually compute the marginal benefit of work by shifting the exogenous retirement age and recomputing the value function. That's basically what you're seeing in those compensating variations. So this is my way of summarizing in my mind uh, the different scenarios. The real interest rate, R, is the first column. The real discount rate, Rho, is the second column. Average wage growth uh, is uh, the third, and then the individual is the fourth. So you can see these scenarios um, the, uh, that they ran. We just heard uh, about uh, results from all but scenarios two and five, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but basically, the takeaways, I think, are very transparent on the implications for consumption and claim age. Uh, the slope of consumption trajectory is really driven by R, this price of future consumption. That's a great way to, uh, uh, to make that point about what should happen to your consumption profile. Uh, but it should be acknowledged that if, you're, if your discount rate has fallen at the same time that the real interest rate has fallen, uh, then the consumption trajectory is going to remain flat. The optimal claim age is pinned down by longevity and the Social Security actuarial fairness or unfairness. Uh, however you want to think about it, um, the agent is basically maximizing the present value of Social Security benefits. So a lower interest rate just puts more weight on these benefits at older ages, uh, and lower G alone does not have an impact. So the, the one sort of set of issues I'm, a, I'm, I'm not quite clear on, again, maybe this is just an exposition issue. The, in the model, utility is a function of consumption alone. So it is a standard life cycle model in that sense. But models that, that have more, uh, uh, more uh, arguments in the utility functions, best way to say it, so be it leisure, be it health, might give us a different answer. And in particular, I think theory, in a more general sense, would tell us that if we have a midlife uh, wealth shock like this, we can do one of three things. We can consume less now, we consume less later, or we can uh, work a little bit longer. Uh, but there's no utility cost of working longer here, so it's not clear how, that, how that's playing out. I doubt, don't doubt that all of these margins are operative, it's just not obvious how or why to me in this model. And uh, the things that popped into my mind is this about discounted timing when the income is received. Uh, it's not about the value of, uh, of leisure per se, so it's got to be something else. And then the other thing you might test is do the results depend on the curvature uh, of the utility function? Is there something there? So is your financial advisor giving you bad advice? This is a great headline for John Chauvin, I think, that you know Chauvin says financial advisor is wrong. Um, so I think it really does matter, you know, it's tied to these same margins of adjustment. And the two scenarios which they didn't focus on, and rightly I think, are, are ones where the real interest rate and the discount rate are coming back down. And in those scenarios, you actually, your optimal saving would increase. So this is the sense in which I think it is going to matter why you think R star is lower. Is it, about some, is it something about preferences or is it something about what's happening in the macro economy? I'm going to come down on the side of saying they picked the right alternatives. Uh, but, uh, but I think we need to, to talk a little bit about why. But while I'm at it, I will go ahead and suggest another scenario to run, which basically completes this, uh, this matrix in, uh, um, and, and looking at the decline in the real average wage 
and both the real interest rate and the real discount rate at the same time and see, see how that looks. So this is my one simple suggestion. I Hopefully it's a simple suggestion, which is basically once you've got the model code in place, you're just feeding in an earnings profile uh, and an op solving an optimal program. Um, we know if we go to something like low, middle, high earners, that the high earners are going to be, uh, uh, the earnings trajectories are higher and steeper at the top. Uh, the Social Security replacement rates are going to be very different, much higher for the low and middle earners. So the baseline wealth is going to be a lot lower. When we saw that baseline trajectory for the cohorts, I think the assets peaked in the $400,000 range. So that's pretty high, uh, depending on how we think of housing. Uh, and so we would have three different sorts of trajectories, and there are also differences of mortality across these groups. I think the model solution is basically the same. Solving the dynamic program is basically the same. But the differences in the responses to R, star, and G may actually tell us something about, about what's driving them. So that was the first part. And I have a couple more minutes, which I'll, I'll, I will use to uh, sort of uh, dive into the deep end of the pool, the macro pool on this, and think about why is it uh, R star and G are lower? What, and how should that affect the way we think about this great question uh, which they've posed, which is what should people be doing? Um, and I think that it's not just what, how individuals should react. I think it's more about how we as a society should be reacting. So basically the solution to the DP model takes R star and G as given, but the optimal responses may well depend on what else is happening in the macro economy. And, and in some models, it might be the case that uh, uh, that if everybody tries to save more, that's just going to depress R star even further and possibly even G uh, if we have excess supply of, of labor in that sense. Um, I also believe the tax and transfer policy rules under which we live will have to change because of it's, they're also highly correlated with R star and G, um, which we will get to. So what are these other relevant macro trends that I have in mind when I think about, when I think about R star and G? So the first, uh, thinking about asset values, uh, PE ratios are, are really at historical highs. And I think as we've been learning over the past few weeks, uh, when uh, owners of uh, capitalized assets are looking at what's happening to interest rates, sometimes they might get a little worried about increases in interest rates. The average return to capital has not fallen. When you hang around macro finance people, they tell you this on a regular basis. Yes, our star is lower, but the average return to capital hasn't fallen. Um, capital gains account for most of wealth change. There's something about how wealth grows over time, these increases in these PE ratios that have more to do with capital gains than they do with sort of saving in a very conventional sense, meaning you have income, subtract consumption. Uh, something else is driving these increases in wealth. We have a very large trade deficit. Why does this matter? Because it means we have a very a uh, very high level of net foreign investment in the U.S. right now, which some people, uh, some people talk about as an important factor uh, in R star. The housing boom was the only recent period of real sustained aggregate demand, and we can directly attribute a lot of what was happening over that period to what was happening with housing. And the fact that um, the net uh, uh, equity extraction from housing, as well as investment in housing, have imploded in the past 10 years, uh, is, is obviously an important macro trend. The Phillips curve is basically flat. There is no sign of wage and price inflation anywhere in sight. Uh, everyone keeps looking for it, uh, and it just doesn't, doesn't seem to be showing up. Employment and earnings dynamics are very different. Um, earnings volatility has actually gone down, but, it, but for, in some ways for the wrong reasons because there's very, very uh, much less upward mobility. Labor and capital shares are down. Labor, labor is way down, right? Labor share of income is way down. Capital is sort of flat, maybe down a little bit. And the literature in macro now is all about factorless income. So this is uh, Caribou, Babunis and, uh, and others focused on what's happening to these shares of income. There's rising industry concentration and markups, and finally rising income and wealth inequality. So this is a bunch of macro facts that, uh, that I use to motivate. Um, how I would think about R star and G uh, and the various stories. So when we think about R star stories in particular, um, you hear uh, one camp is all about savings gluts and, uh, uh, and aging, right? So these ideas are really consistent with a very, very old uh, view of the world, the original overlapping generations model by Paul Samuelson, uh, which, which relies on a consumption loans logic. By the way, this is absolutely consistent with, uh, with the solutions that the authors showed us. 
Um, so in this model, there's no storage mechanism. You have three generations, and these generations have to bargain with each other. So you don't work when you're old, and the only way you can have consumption when you're old is if when you were middle age, you lent some money to the young people who are then repaying you loans, and that's how you consume. So, so this, this view of sort of aging and how aging should have an impact on our star, I think it's, it's somewhat tied to that. And if you throw in foreign money flowing into the U.S., it's like adding even more middle-aged people. And so this, this decreasing our star, if it's a result of some aging-related increase in the demand for future consumption, then your Samuelson made it clear in his, his very simple model, real R star might actually be negative when, when population is aging. Um, and, and the solution, go back, I do encourage you to, to read this, this old paper. It's wonderful. I pull it out and reread it every once in a while. The solution is either inflation or government deficits because it's a way of allocating resources across generations in a more efficient way. So um, in, in more sort of modern macro finance, people are thinking about extending this and thinking about what's happening with our star as an interplay of industry markups, intangible capital, productivity, uh, and distribution. Uh, and there's questions like, is concentration, industry concentration, leading to higher rents, i.e. lower, lower wages? Um, where does the return to intangible capital show up? Is this part of the factorless income uh, in GDP? Uh, is this... Is this uh, uh, is this intangible capital that we're looking at, uh, you know, in particular the great innovations uh, that, that really are the result of labor uh, not showing up as part of labor income? Uh, is productivity low because labor-saving investment uh, is generally, or labor-enhancing investment, however you want to say it? Uh, and, then, and then are R star and G low because of insufficient aggregate demand or misallocation? So is there something going on? Um, about within the economy now that's, that's, that's leading us to believe that we're in this permanently lower R star and G situation that's not about, um, not about something aging or some, uh, some technology driven thing, but it's something about markets and it's something about uh, uh, the distribution of resources. So what does this imply for Social Security? Um, so uh, when uh, people talk about uh, Social Security funding, Lower G has really important implications for Social Security and the ability, especially when we think on a pay-go basis. And at some point, there's a certain fraction of working young. They have certain wages, and they're paying benefits to, uh, to the retired old. And uh, having played around with these sorts of models at CBO, I know that if we, if we uh, increased or decreased uh, the real wage growth, it had an impact. And it was, the impact was really driven through the fact that uh, uh, the workers were so much more productive, they could afford to pay these promised benefits to the old um, because their agent, their real wage adjusted benefits were actually falling uh, as they continued to age. So that's the mechanism that's important, that you don't have uh, rich young guys paying benefits to, uh, uh, to fixed uh, level, fixed wealth or fixed income old guys. Lower R star does it really matter if the trust fund is gone. Um, uh, but, uh, but it does matter as long as we, we do have a trust fund. And, and the question I wonder, you know, in, in thinking, I pose this question myself, what does this imply about Social Security? And I think the answer, it may depend on how you think about why Social Security exists in the first place, what role it plays. And, and if you have a, a view of Social Security, as many macro uh, general equilibrium modelers do, that it's a, it, it enters a, a normally functioning, well-functioning economy as a tax and transfer system, which redistributes resources, then I wonder if the system is actually less inefficient when R star and G are low. And I think that might be worth asking, asking those sorts of models. Maybe we should ask Ken Smetters or someone else who plays with those kinds of models. But if you go back to Samuelson, you think about what is it that Social Security is doing, right? It's actually helping with this consumption loans problem that, that in a sense, if we have this imbalance between uh, between uh, the saving that people want to have and the, and the borrowing that people are willing to do, Social Security is one way that actually helps to fix that, Im that imbalance. And, and in some ways, I think this comes back to, uh, you know, what would a social planner say about these cohorts? We think about this, again, not just from what the individuals are doing, but what we as a society should be doing in the face of lower R star and G. Uh, would a social planner say that they should work longer or save more on average? Or is most of what needs to be addressed happening within cohorts? And this kind of gets back to the important point in the paper about this great insurance effect of 
aggregate wage growth. This is so important that even if my wages are growing more slowly, if the economy continues to grow, everybody else's wages continue to grow, I'm insured. In some ways, if we go back to thinking about what's happening to factor incomes, these macro trends, that if much more of um, uh, production is showing up in types of income that are not in being included in wages, if that's the reason why real wage growth is lower, then we want, might want to think more generally about this insurance role of Social Security and acknowledge that with a declining labor income share, uh, maybe uh, some other sorts of changes are, are necessary. And with that, great paper. Thank you for inviting me.